glycosidic linkage. And what I'm going to do is over here on this part of the board, I'm going to keep a running list of the type of molecule we're talking about, its bond, its monomer, and its function. Because that's basically what I'm going to want you to know for the exam. Okay, so carbohydrates. The monomer are mono saccharides. The bond is a glycosidic linkage. And the function is short term, at least for us. So we can take uh, individual monosaccharides and we can make something more than disaccharides out of them. We can make complex polysaccharides out of them. So polysaccharides are more than two monosaccharides that are connected by glycosidic linkages. Um, and while monosaccharides are primarily for usage, polysaccharides are primarily for storage. <coughs> Here are some really good examples of polysaccharides. We've already talked about one, and that's starch, right? Starch is just a whole bunch of glucose molecules stuck together. And what's interesting about starch is its three-dimensional conformation is like a helix. It just kind of spins like a tube in space. Starch is the primary storage molecule for carbohydrates in plants. You won't find starch in animals. We do have a closely related molecule, however, that we do use for the storage of carbohydrates, and that's glycogen. There are large glycogen deposits in our muscles and large glycogen deposits in our livers. Glycogen is a little bit different than starch because every so often coming off of glycogen, there are branches, so it doesn't form this nice tube. It's a much larger, bulkier, irregular looking molecule. Okay, so both starch and glycogen are for energy storage, but there are two other uh, polysaccharides that aren't used for energy storage, rather, they're used for structure. The first of which is called cellulose. And cellulose is a structural polysaccharide that plants use in their cell walls. It's estimated that this is the most abundant organic molecule on the Earth. That makes some sense, right? Because when you look outside, the world is green, and that greenery is plants, and plants largely consist of cellulose. Around each of their cell walls, they have a structural polysaccharide, a network of cellulose. Cellulose has a slightly different chemical structure than starch does. It's glucose molecules stuck together, but they're different conformations of that same glucose molecule. There is an alpha glucose and a beta glucose. And in uh, cellulose, you alternate alpha and beta uh, glucoses. And what that does is it prevents the molecule from spiraling in space and allows it to lay flat. So cellulose cell walls are really like interwoven matrices of this alternating alpha beta glucose polysaccharide. Uh, there is another structural polysaccharide called chitin that's found in some animals and in fungi. Like plants, fungi have cell walls, and that cell wall consists rather of cellulose, it consists of chitin. Um, arthropods, things that have like hard shells like insects and spiders, crabs and lobsters, those exoskeletons consist largely of 
chitin as well. It's a structural polysaccharide. So this is a picture of cellulose. And what you have are alternating alpha and beta glucose subunits. And because they're alternating alpha and beta, they don't spiral in space. They just lay flat, and they can form large microfibril networks. And it's those interwoven microfibril networks that allow um, plants to have this rigid cell wall. Now, plant cell walls are important for the plant's structure. They don't have a skeletal system, right? But yet, they remain upright. And they remain upright because these cellulose cell walls are quite rigid, and they allow a plant to remain at least somewhat erect. Okay, so those are our carbs. Questions about carbs? Function is short-term energy, short energy storage. Exactly right. And the bond between monomers is glycosidic linkage. <coughs> so we're going to shift our attention now away from um, carbohydrates, and then we're going to talk a little bit about lipids. So lipids are um, a fairly diverse group of molecules. We use them for energy storage, long-term energy storage. We use them for insulation, for cushioning vital organs. They're important constituents of cell membranes. So they do quite a bit in our bodies. I know we have this knee-jerk reaction when we talk about fats, that they're inherently bad, but they aren't. They're inherently necessary. They're also really important for communication. I just saw that on the board. So there is a class of fats called steroids, and steroids are really, really important, naturally occurring molecules that communicate specific changes throughout our body, and we're going to talk about steroids in a few minutes. But first I want to talk about the dietary fats, the triglycerides. And uh, I guess to backpedal just a little bit, within the lipids, there are no monomers. Um, there really are no polymers either. Fats are defined as hydrophobic substances which is quite different than the other molecules. Sugars are defined as, carbohydrates are defined as, particularly polysaccharides, as monosaccharides attached by glycosidic linkages. Anything that is a big chain of monosaccharides is a polysaccharide. But there is no like unifying theme for all of the lipids, except that they don't dissolve well in water. So when we talk about lipids, there's not going to be a monomer at all. We're just going to skip that one. Our lipids, all right, monomer, um, the bond, at least within our triglycerides, our dietary fats, is called an ester bond or an ester linkage. And the function is varied, but I would like you to know that they are important for long-term energy storage. Cell membranes. And communication. I don't know why I write on the board because nobody can read my writing. But it says communication. Okay, so dietary fats, which are collectively called their triglycerides, consist of two primary uh, molecules. The first of which is called. Glycerol. So glycerol looks like this. It's a three carbon chain. It's a three carbon chain that's attached to a whole bunch of hydrogens and an 
oxygen into hydrogen. So these are called hydroxyl groups, and that's glycerol. That's the backbone of our triglycerides. And then what we do is we attach each of those carbons to something called a fatty acid chain. And fatty acid chains look like this. They're long um, chains of carbons like that. And this terminal carbon is double bonded to um, an oxygen and then a hydrogen. And then each of these carbons is attached to a hydrogen. That's what a fatty acid chain looks like. These are both really inert substances. They don't dissolve in water at all. They're not polar in the least. So if we wanted to attach via dehydration synthesis this molecule to that molecule, how would we do it? Yeah. Can you just uh, like Use those two, the OH, use okay. that H. And this H right here? Yeah. I love it. So take out that OH and that H, make a water molecule, and then attach that carbon directly to that carbon. Great. Except that I lied to you. This is actually an OH. Sorry. But you're right, you're going to take that H, that OH, so it's going to be C connected to that oxygen, connected to that carbon. So that in the end, it's, I'm going to erase this. Does anyone want to take a picture of that before I erase it? Mm -hmm. You can stay in there. <laughs> that would just devalue the picture. No. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> so in the end, it's going to look like this. Those two carbons, connect you to an oxygen like that. And it's called a triglyceride because we get this glycerol molecule attached to three fatty acid chains. So this is going to be connected to a carbon and a carbon. And I won't draw the rest of it. Like that. So you'll notice that I threw a double bond in here, and that's going to be important in just a second. But a triglyceride is defined as a glycerol molecule covalently bonded to three fatty acid chains. This bond right here, that's our ester bond or our ester linkage. The function of triglycerides is long-term energy storage. When we overeat sugars, our bodies convert glucose and fructose into triglycerides. And then we store that in a special series of tissues called adipose. <coughs> so um, there are different types of triglycerides, right? There are saturated triglycerides and there are unsaturated triglycerides. And saturated triglycerides means that all of the fatty acid chains are saturated with single bonds. There are no double bonds in between carbons on saturated fats. This is an example of an unsaturated triglyceride because it has a double bond there. So these two different types of fats have important physical properties. Saturated triglycerides become solid at room temperature. Unsaturated triglycerides remain liquid at room temperature. Can you guys think of a fat that when you heat up it becomes a liquid, but when you allow it to cool it becomes a solid? Butter. Butter is a really good example of that. Can you think of others? Bacon grease. Bacon grease is another really good example from that. And where do we get bacon grease from? Where do we get bacon from? Pigs, which is an animal, right? Where do we get butter from? Cows, which is an animal. Generally speaking, the fats that we get from animals are saturated. 
the fats that we get from plants are unsaturated. And the reason that they become solid at room temperature, and if I was to draw a, like a, a stick figure of a triglyceride, a saturated triglyceride looks something like that. Those fatty acid chains remain linear in space. They're like little Legos, and you can pack them all in really tightly together. Unsaturated triglycerides have a bend in them. And that bend is the spot of the double bond. And because it has that bend in it, you're not going to get fats stacking up closely to each other, and they're going to remain liquid. The problem is margarine. What is margarine? It is a vegetable oil. I mean, that's what it is. It's vegetable oil. But does it remain solid at room temperature? Yeah. I mean, it does. I mean, if you take margarine out of the fridge, it, unless you keep your house at like 95 degrees, it's going to be a solid at room temperature. So how do we make that? How do we make a vegetable oil, which is inherently uh, an unsaturated fat, a solid at room temperature? Well, the answer is this. What we can do is we can take unsaturated fats and we can blast them with a whole bunch of hydrogen so that we take that double bond and we break it and make it a single bond. The problem is when we do that, sometimes that blasting makes one of the fatty acid chains end up on the opposite end of the glycerol from the other two fatty acid chains. This is called a trans fat. And trans fats are much more common in hydrogenated vegetable oils like margarine than they are in regular unsaturated fats and saturated fats. So if we had to think about the healthfulness of these types of fats, saturated, unsaturated, and trans fats, which are the best fats to eat, to consume? Regular, saturated or unsaturated? Saturated. Close to saturation. Unsaturated. Those are by far the, 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 by best I mean, least likely to lead to arterial sclerosis and hardening of the arteries. These are generally more healthy for us, but they're not great for toast, right? You can't pour olive oil on your toast. It just doesn't taste as good. So you have to make a decision now between uh, saturated fats and trans fats, which is